Good evening. Uh, welcome to the Center for Global Humanities at the University of New England. Uh, my name is Anwar Majid. I'm the founding director of the center. And I'm accompanied here in this, a, a, virtually speaking, with my colleagues, Neil Jandro uh, and Dave Diego, who are working very hard. Josh Pahigian is in Biddeford, the faculty the professor who's teaching our students there. And we have a very, very special event. Uh, our, we, tonight we are hosting Kathleen Sanderson. Uh, she is a, a very well-known uh, uh, expert on a variety of subjects related to psychology and other things. And uh, she spoke here before. She's probably actually an exceptional speaker. She's now a friend of the center, a big supporter of the center. She came here in January 2015. Catherine, and then she was our commencement speaker in 2018. Uh, and we just simply cannot have enough of Catherine's lectures and, and ideas. So we are so, so delighted to have her tonight. I will give you a very brief uh, biographical introduction to her and her work. And then, uh, then she, will give us a, she will give a lecture. And after which, uh, we will have a Q&A conversation with her, including our students who are right now in Biddeford, uh, eager to ask a few questions. So Kathleen Sanderson is the Manuel Family Professor of Life Sciences, Psychology at Amherst College. Uh, she received a bachelor's degree in psychology with a specialization in health and development from Stanford University and received both master's and doctoral degrees in psychology from Princeton. Her research has received grant funding from the National Science Foundation and the National Institute of Health and and Professor Sanderson has published over 25 journal articles and book chapters in addition to four college textbooks, middle school and high school health textbooks, and trade books on parenting, as well as how mindset influences happiness, health, and even how long we live, the positive shift. In, 20, uh, in 2012, she was named one of the country's top 300 professors by the Princeton Review. That's just simply absolutely amazing. Professor Sanderson speaks regularly for public and corporate audiences on topics such as the science of happiness. This is the topic, this is the lecture she first gave at, at the Center for Global Humanities. The power of emotional intelligence, the mind-body connection, and the psychology of good and evil. Absolutely fascinating. I may have a question about that later on tonight. These talks have been featured in numerous mainstream media outlets, including the Washington Post, the Boston Globe, the Atlantic, CNN, and CBS Sunday Morning with Jane Pauley. She also writes a blog for Psychology Today, Norms Matter, that examines the power of social influence on virtually all aspects of our lives. Her latest book, uh, published in, in the United States or North America, as Why We Act, uh, Turning Bystanders into Moral Re Rebels, I love the idea of moral rebels, published by Harvard University Press, and internationally as The Bystander Effect, the Psychology of Courage and Inaction by HarperCollins. It examines why good people so often stay silent and do nothing in the face of wrongdoing. Uh, for a preview of the topic she addre uh, addressed in this book, and if you want, further, if you want to explore her, her ideas further after this event, after the lecture tonight and the conversation, you could find her uh, on TED Talks. Uh, she gave a TED Talk um, on, on the psychology of inaction, which, is, which, uh, uh, which then you can continue to be provoked and engaged with her thinking. And with that, I will leave you with Professor Sanderson uh, and for an exceptionally evening of conversation and ideas. Catherine? Well, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And I will say that, as you noted, this is a repeat invite. And I am struck, I don't know if you remember this, but in January of 2015, do you remember that it was like a terrible blizzard when I came, like I was supposed to have dinner and then I didn't have dinner because like the roads were closing and and like Massachusetts had declared a state of emergency and I was driving back. And so I was so looking forward when you invited me to give this lecture and I was like, oh good, we'll finally have a chance to have dinner. And of course I'm in Massachusetts and you're not. And once again, we seem to be struck. So the yes. next time that you invite me, I'm yes. gonna get dinner. I'm just yeah, gonna say I promise you that. I okay, promise I you. I promise you. <laughs> on, on that, on that um, note of, of weird uh, global disasters, 
I am, I'm so delighted to, to talk to you all. And, and I'm going to, I have prepared a very short presentation because honestly, what I love is the interaction with the questions. And so I want to make sure that we have plenty of time uh, to, to discuss any questions people have or that my book or, or this talk raised. But I want to start by sharing the story of what was the prompt for me to write this. As my lovely introduction uh, just described, I had written a book called The Positive Shift, which examines happiness. So I was in the midst of doing final marketing and publicity for that book when my oldest child, Andrew, started college just about three years ago now. And Andrew's very independent and was very ready for college. So we settled him into his dorm room. We you know, bought him a fridge and, and rug from Walmart. And my husband and I drove home. And we didn't really hear anything from Andrew for like two weeks, like literally nothing. Uh, an occasional call saying, how do you do laundry? Or you know, can I have some more money or something? But, but basically nothing. And then about two weeks in, my phone rang one day. And it was Andrew, his voice was breaking. And he said, a student died in my dorm last night. And as a mom of three, and as a professor who of course works with so many students, I was just heartbroken with the story that he told me, which was a story that is frankly all too familiar to you all, even if you don't know the particulars of this case. The student had been drinking and at around 9 p.m. on a Saturday night, he fell and hit his head. His roommates and friends watched over him because they wanted him to be okay. They cared about him. So they checked to make sure he was still breathing. They put him in his bed and strapped a backpack around his shoulders to prevent him from rolling onto his back and then vomiting and choking to death. So they watched over him for hours because they wanted him to be okay. But what they didn't do for 19 hours was call 911. And when they finally called, it was too late. The student's family flew in from out of town. They were with him when the hospital disconnected him from life support, but he died 19 years old, his first two weeks of college. And I'm in the middle of doing this publicity about this book on happiness and, and health. But what I'm thinking about almost all the time is how could that story have gone differently? And that was actually the prompt that led me to sort of examine the psychology of what I call the psychology of inaction. Because here's the thing, those were, I imagine, good kids. They were good kids, they were nice kids, they were smart kids, they wanted to do the right thing by their friend. And yet, they didn't call to get him help for 19 hours. And it's possible that had they called earlier, that situation would have had a better outcome. So this book, Why We Act, uh, came out in April of this year. And I want to tell you now a couple of examples that, have, that are not in the book because they've happened since then, but I think sort of speak to the universality of that experience. So one, in April, shortly after the book came out, a friend of mine had picked up a copy and she then called me and said, I want to tell you a story. And the story is about her daughter. Her daughter, Claire, just graduated from college. She's you know, 21, 22 years old. She's living in Boston right now. And, and Claire is Chinese. She was adopted from China when she was you know, one or two years old, a baby. So Claire is in Boston in March and she's on a crowded bus going to work. And this is right around the time the coronavirus pandemic was you know, pretty much shutting down a lot of places. So a man on the bus stands up points at Claire and says, you should go back to China. You and your people have brought us the coronavirus. You are killing us. You should go back. You're hurting Americans. So the man is yelling at her. Claire is, you know, 22 years old. She's on this crowded bus. And here's what her mom tells me. Not a single person on the bus did anything. No one told that man to shut up. No one went over and, you know, sat with Claire and, you know, reassured her. And everybody on the bus knew that, that Claire had not brought the coronavirus. I mean, no one was like, oh, maybe that is the person. I mean, everybody knew, and yet no one spoke up. And then in June, I saw some footage that I imagine is familiar to every single person listening to this talk of an event in Minneapolis that led to the death of George Floyd. And when I saw that image of the officer kneeling on George Floyd's neck, what occurred to me was actually not that officer. 
what occurred to me was the three other officers who were right with him. There were four of them. One of them was kneeling. But if the other three had have stepped up, pulled their colleague off, told him to get off, Mr. Floyd would be alive today. And if you want more of my thoughts on that, I actually published an op-ed co-authored with Cornell Brooks, the former president of the NAACP. It was published in June in USA Today. So, and we talk in depth in that op-ed about this inaction, that these were his colleagues should have stepped up and done the right thing. So this phenomenon of failing to act in all kinds of situations, it happens not just in fraternities or drunken college students, it happens on public transportation, it happens in locker rooms, it happens in boardrooms. It is a universal phenomenon. And what my book examines is why. <laughs> why do good people stay silent in all kinds of situations? And basically, it comes down to three factors. One, we don't really know what's happening. The challenge of ambiguity, that in some cases we see or we hear something and we're not really sure if what we're seeing or hearing is problematic. Um, is that student actually unconscious or just drunk? Is that a romantic sexual encounter or is that sexual harassment or assault? Is that joke funny or is it actually like a racist or sexist slur? So the challenge is that in situations in which we don't really know what we're seeing or hearing, what do we do? Well, we look around and we see how other people are acting. But the problem is, if everyone is looking to everyone else, no one may actually step up and get the person help. And this happens in all kinds of situations. In one tragic story that, that some people may be familiar with, a two-year-old boy became separated from his mom in a crowded shopping mall in England. And she looked everywhere for him, she couldn't find him, she reported him missing. And two days later, his body was found beside some railroad tracks. He'd been beaten to death by two older boys. So they went back through the mall videotape and they, and they saw footage of this little boy being dragged by two older boys. And the little boy is screaming. He's saying, leave me alone. Let me go. I don't want to go. He's, he, it's clear. He's upset. He's loud. And the mall was crowded. Lots of people noticed. But here's the thing. We've all seen a toddler having a fit in a shopping mall. No one is like, that's an emergency. It's a kidnapping. And that's the challenge. Lots of people saw it and they said, that's a little boy who doesn't want to go with his brothers or that's a little boy who wants a toy or a candy bar or something. It's not an emergency. And the challenge is, in many situations, we look to other people and everyone is kind of doing a poker face, trying not to appear that they are uncomfortable with what's happening. And that poker face leads people astray. In a really classic demonstration of this, researchers brought in college students and they put them in a small room alone to fill out a questionnaire. So you're in the room alone, you're filling out a questionnaire and all of a sudden smoke starts pouring in. Now, you can probably imagine what people do if you're alone in a room and smoke starts pouring in. Everybody gets up and goes to get help because it's smoke. Then they did another version. They hired two other students and they told these students, no matter what happens, don't interact at all. Just keep filling out the questionnaire. So you're in a room, you're filling out a survey, smoke starts coming in. You look to the two other people and they've been told not to interact, not to pretend they notice nothing. So they continue to fill it out. They don't even look up. And, and the researchers let the smoke continue to pour in for six minutes. And it got so thick that people had to like wave away the smoke just to even be able to see their survey. And yet most people sit in that room <laughs> for six minutes while it fills with smoke and they don't act because the other two people weren't acting, so they don't either. Now, then the researcher says, did you notice the smoke? And everyone says, oh yes, yes I did. And then the researcher says, well, what'd you think it was? And they have all sorts of non-emergency explanations. I thought it was an air conditioning vent malfunctioning. Um, I thought it was truth serum you were pumping into the room. They have all these other explanations that are not, it's smoke, it's a fire, I should go get help. And that's the challenge. And the reality is in many situations, we look to other people's behavior and their behavior looks exactly the same as ours, but we assume that their behavior is being driven by something else entirely. A classic example I tell my students, and I bet all the students listening to this can remember a time in which a professor has said, 
do you have any questions? And you in fact did have a question, but then you looked around at everybody else and nobody was raising their hand. So you put your hand down. Now, you know why you didn't answer, ask a question because you didn't want to look stupid. And you looked around at everybody else, they're not raising their hands. Well, you know, you don't want to look stupid. So you put your hand down. But here's the challenge. When you look at everybody else not raising their hands, you don't think they don't want to look stupid. No, you think those people are really smart. They don't have any questions. They know the answer. Um, and that's the exact example of the smoke-filled room. You know why you're not raising your hand. You don't want to look stupid. But when you look at everybody else not raising their hand, you don't think they don't want to look stupid. No, you think those people are smart. So one factor that inhibits people stepping up is ambiguity about what's happening. And that leads you to stay silent because you look at other people and they're not interacting at all. But in other conditions, and this is the second factor, we know what's going on. We totally recognize it's an emergency. But if we're in a group setting, we assume it's not our responsibility to help. Somebody else can help. I don't have to be the one. And, and that's a phenomenon that we often refer to as the bystander effect or diffusion of responsibility. A classic example of this that you may know well um, was the case of Kitty Genovese, who, as it was described years ago, was in New York City, came home late at night. A man jumped out of the bushes and started attacking her. And as it was reported at the time, and some evidence now suggests it was not exactly reported correctly, but as it was reported at the time, her neighbors turned on their lights, looked around, saw that everybody else had turned on their lights. And so everybody assumed, well, somebody else has probably called the police. I don't have to. And, and that was a phenomenon that led to this start in psychology of studying the so-called diffusion of responsibility in group settings. And we see this in lots of different conditions. You all have probably remember seeing footage of a man, maybe this was about three years ago now, being dragged off a United Airlines flight that was overbooked. So the flight was overbooked, they asked for volunteers, and there weren't enough volunteers, so airport security got on the plane and they dragged this man off the plane. And if you've seen the images, uh, he was pretty injured. I mean, he, I think he lost a tooth. He had like a bruised eye. I mean, his head, you know, bumped against the, the seat rest. And here's what's fascinating. Everybody on the plane knew it was awful. And that's why you probably know what I'm talking about. Um, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, Google it and the images will come up. Everybody on the plane was like, this is awful. And so here's what they did. They took out their phones and they started videoing it. And as soon as they got off the plane, they uploaded those videos to social media. And that's why we know about this case. I, I probably no one listening to this was actually on the plane. But here's what's fascinating from a psychology perspective. Nobody on the plane stood up and said, stop dragging that man off the plane. They videoed, but they didn't stand up and tell him to stop it. And here's why. Each of those passengers was like, well, I'm just a passenger. I'm not the pilot, I'm not the flight attendant, I'm not the police, and so nobody actually did anything. And that's the phenomenon of diffusion of responsibility. And this too happens in all kinds of situations. It's why college students really don't like group projects <laughs> because if in group project, somebody else you know, might assume you're gonna do all the work so everybody kind of slacks off. It's also why uh, restaurants often impose a mandatory tipping rate on parties of six or more because in group settings, many people sort of under tip and they assume, well, these other people will make up when I'm not contributing. So this is another phenomenon that happens in all kinds of situations. In a group setting, even if we recognize it's an emergency, many people don't help. But I'm now gonna turn to the third factor that leads to people to stay inactive in lots of situations. And this is honestly, I think the, the one that's the most common and that is fear of the consequences we worry about the consequences of stepping up. In some cases, this can include physical consequences. You might remember hearing a story about three men on a train in Portland, Oregon a couple years ago. They heard a man yelling racist slurs at two young women on the train. Um, one of the women was Muslim, one of the women was black. And these were you know, teenagers. So these three men stood up and did the right thing. They told that man to stop it, to stop yelling these racist things at these two young women. And that man then pulled out a knife and stabbed all three of them. And two of those men died. And that's the kind of fear that in some cases we have. 
I'd like to step up and do the right thing. I'd like to say something, but I also have to worry about my personal safety. And so I don't speak up. But in many cases, it's not so much personal safety as it is professional fears or personal fears. Many times people fail to speak up because they worry about the consequences of being the whistleblower, of being the troublemaker. So people stay silent. A couple of years ago, I read an article, an interview in the New York Times, and it was an interview with actor director Quentin Tarantino. And this was right around the time that all of the reports of Harvey Weinstein were coming out and he'd been arrested. So the reporters asked Quentin Tarantino a question, longtime collaborator with Harvey Weinstein. Here's the question. Did you know what was going on? And here's what he said. I knew enough to do more than I did. Now, what Quentin Tarantino did was nothing. So to the extent that you could have done something more than nothing, yes, that is true. But he was not alone. Many people apparently knew a lot about what was happening with Harvey Weinstein. And many people stayed silent because he was making and breaking careers. He was winning people Oscars. He was winning, earning people lots of money. And so a lot of people stayed silent for many years because they worried about the professional consequences. And this happens in all kinds of settings. We, many of us heard, first heard about the Boston sex abuse scandal when it was broke within the Catholic church, when it was broke by the Boston Globe spotlight team. And they uncovered that for years, priests had been abusing little boys and little girls. And instead of calling and reporting it to the authorities, they passed these priests from parish to parish and more kids got abused as a result. And of course, that's not an unusual situation. We've heard of that come out of the Olympic gymnastics doctor. We've heard of that coming out at Penn State. We've heard of that occurring in lots of different places. And that's sadly not unique. And finally, we worry about the personal consequences. Are people not gonna like me? If I call out a friend or a relative or a colleague for making a racist slur, for making a homophobic joke, for engaging in some kind of inappropriate behavior, are people not going to like me? And that fear of social consequences leads people to stay silent in all different kinds of situations. A student was in my office one day, just about a year ago now back when students used to come to my office. Uh, and he was on the basketball team, very good student, senior. And he said to me, every day in the locker room, someone says something offensive. And sometimes I speak up and sometimes I don't. And what occurred to me, of course, is that it's very possible that everybody else in that locker room was also thinking, that's offensive. But that nobody spoke up because everyone's worried Will they not like me? Will I get in trouble for saying that? Will I experience a consequence? And there's fascinating research in the field of social neuroscience that has now shown that being rejected, being ostracized, excluded from your group, from your friends, from your colleagues, from your family members, activates a particular part of the brain. And it actually activates the exact same part of the brain that is activated when you experience physical pain, when you touch a hot stove, when you twist your ankle, when you get a paper cut. And so what that tells us is that we don't want to experience social rejection because it literally feels painful. And that means we are highly motivated to toe the line, to fit in with our group, to conform. And that's the reality that keeps many people silent in lots of different situations. Now, I know this has been kind of depressing, and so I want to end by talking about the good news. And, and there is good news. And the good news is that understanding the psychology of inaction can actually help us speak up in all kinds of different situations. And, and I wanna share with you now, I'm gonna literally read it aloud, a wonderful quote um, that, that you may be familiar with by Martin Luther King Jr. And here's the quote. History will have to record that the greatest tragedy of this period of social transition was not the strident clamor of the bad people, but the appalling silence of the good people. 
And to me, that's, and just FYI, that's what I wanted to call my book. So the title that I wanted, <laughs> which I lost on, as you can tell, but what I wanted to title my book was The Appalling Silence of the Good People. And my publisher was like, that's a little negative. Um, but, but that's what I wanted to call it. I wanted to call it The Appalling Silence of the Good People because my theory is, is there are lots of good people. There are lots and lots of good people in the world. There are good people on police departments. There are good people in fraternities. There are good people in boardrooms. There are good people in locker rooms. And yet there are good people who are appallingly silent. And that's what leads bad behavior to continue. So what do we know helps? And I wanna just tell you very briefly what the research tells us can help. One, we need to think about what we're gonna say before we're in a situation. Um, and, and this is the idea of practicing. Many times as I've been talking about this subject, people will tell me these stories and they'll say, this happened to me like 20 years ago and I should have said something. And people will tell me stories that have stuck with them 10 years ago, 20 years ago, times they, and what they say is, I saw it, I didn't say anything, I didn't know what to do. And then invariably it follows with this. Two days later, I was in the shower and I thought of the perfect response. But of course that's, you know, two days too late. And so part of it is that you need to practice. What will you say in a situation? And, and this is the theory by which people have CPR training. We have CPR training so that if you're in a situation in which you need to use CPR, you can use it. You're not like, what did I learn 20 years ago when I took CPR training? People who are CPR trained get trained every year or two. And the reason for that is so you can step up in an emergency if it happens. So think ahead. What will you say or do? And it doesn't have to be standing up and saying, you're racist, you're sexist, you're stupid, you know, whatever. It can be something small. It can be, well, what do you mean by that? Or, you know, I used to, to think the same way. And then I learned or you probably don't know, but some people think, and again, it can be a way of just calling out the behavior, making a point of saying, you know, that's kind of problematic. And simply by identifying it as such can be helpful. So come up with a phrase, a statement, something that you can say in the moment uh, to interrupt bad behavior, to call out something. So that's one. Two, foster empathy. Feel empathy for other people. Uh, we aren't so good at that often in our society. And I worry about this one, frankly, a lot. But the reality is when we put ourselves in somebody else's shoes, it is much easier for us to speak up in all kinds of situations. Research has shown that if you can put yourself in somebody else's shoes, you're much more likely to step up, even if you're gonna experience personal consequences. So as a mom, I would really hope that if it was my son unconscious in a dorm room, someone would make the call. And if it was my daughter on a crowded bus in Boston and somebody was yelling racist slurs at her, I really hope somebody would speak up. And so part of it is we need to put ourselves in somebody else's shoes. How would it feel if you were the person or your child or your spouse or your sister was in that situation? So try to foster empathy. That often can give people the courage to speak up. Three, find a friend. In many cases, it's hard to show moral courage alone, that we worry about the consequences, we worry about looking stupid. If we have someone with us, it's often much easier to speak up. You've probably seen the iconic picture of four young men sitting at a lunch counter in Greensboro, North Carolina in the 1960s. And these four men started a major movement in the civil rights and they did so, four black men, young college students, young kids, really, the KKK protested outside. They worried about their safety, and reasonably so. But the four of them were friends and roommates, and they stuck together, and that gave them the courage. We see time and time again people not speaking up unless they have someone else with them. So try to find a friend. And finally, look for the ethical leaders that ethical leadership is contagious. And when we have ethical leaders in colleges, in universities, in fraternities, in police departments, in the government, people will follow those ethical leaders. There's a wonderful book written about the Holocaust and it's called The Village of Secrets. And it's a book that describes one specific town in France in which there was a minister. And that minister said, God loves the Jews just like he loves the Christians, God loves everybody. And so when the Nazis came through France and said, turn over your Jews, the other towns turned over their Jews. 
and this one town did not. Every time the Nazis came through, they hid them. They hid them in attics, they hid them in basements, they hid them in cupboards, and they said, we have no Jews here. And estimates are they saved 1,500 Jewish men, women, and children. And that's an example of ethical leadership. Um, more recently, uh, there was a wonderful example of this that occurred in June of this year. A young man, 19, 20 years old, black uh, college student at the University of Mississippi, tweeted out, I will not be representing this state on the football team anymore as long as the Confederate flag stays the same. I'm done. And he tagged Tate Reeves, the Republican governor of Mississippi. As you may know, <laughs> about a week after that, the governor said, you know what, maybe we should revisit that flag issue. And on election day this year, the Mississippi government um, enveloped a new flag that has a magnolia on it. And that is now the flag that is, that is the Mississippi state flag. And so ethical leaders can take all forms and can really make a difference. And finally, I want to end by sharing one more quote. And it's a quote by John Steinbeck from East of Eden. And, and this is how my book ends. And, and I use this quote because what I'm really hoping is that by talking and writing about the psychology of inaction, we can change our culture. And we can change our culture in ways that actually leads people to step up and act instead of stay, staying silent in all kinds of situations. And I wanna share this quote with you now. Humans are caught in their lives, in their thoughts, in their hungers and ambitions, in their avarice and cruelty, and in their kindness and generosity too, in a net of good and evil. A man, after he has brushed off the dust and chips of his life, will have left only the hard, clean questions. Was it good or was it evil? Have I done well or ill? And what I'm hoping is that understanding the psychology of inaction gives people the tools and strategies they can use to speak up in all kinds of situations. And I wanna share one final story, which is an example of how cultures can change. My daughter, Caroline, was born on May 17, 2004. And that is actually a historic date in the United States, not because she was born that day, but because that day was the first day that Massachusetts legalized gay marriage. And, and Massachusetts was the first state in the United States to legalize gay marriage. So on the day Caroline was born, Massachusetts became the first state to legalize gay marriage. 11 years later, June of 2015, Caroline and I are in the car when an announcement comes on the radio that the Supreme Court has legalized gay marriage across the country. And I turned to Caroline and I said, wow, it is amazing. The day you were born, it was one state and 11 years later, it's the whole country. Like that's unbelievable. And Caroline looked up at me and said, yes, what took so long? <laughs> and of course, that's not long <laughs> to have that kind of a sea change, but it's an example of how cultures reach a tipping point and all of a sudden th things change. And so I'm hoping that my book is a call to action where speaking up and calling out bad behavior uh, becomes normal and expected, and that together we can change the world and keep the appalling, the silent people from being silent and instead encourage them to speak up. So thank you so much. And that is the end of my prepared um, comments. And I'm so looking forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Catherine. Uh, we, I'm sure we have a lot of questions. I just wanted to mention a couple of things very briefly. One of them is I was very proud to, to, to read in your book that there was a CPR case in, in Maine that somebody saved a life, you know. <laughs> what do you think? And, uh, well, yeah, the, and that's, yeah, and well, and that's a great example, right? Of somebody literally, they knew the skills, they practiced it, they recently had a training and they literally saved someone in a gym. Yeah, great yeah, example. Yeah, yeah. Uh, great. And uh, I, haven't, I haven't checked that, that, that link you, you mentioned in the book, but I, I suspect that it could be one of our friends and colleagues who, who had an incident like that in the gym. He had a heart attack and then he was saved. I, I, I cannot wait to actually check that link to see who it is. <laughs> okay, good, good. <laughs> so, 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 no, secondly, you know, I just wanted to bring your attention. I don't know whether you've, you're familiar with this. It's a case in France in 2015, three Americans on a train, they stopped a major terrorist and that, 
And Clint Eastwood made a movie about that. You know what it is? The, it's called the 1517 to Paris. I, in case the students haven't seen it yet, it's, it's highly, I highly recommend it. It's based on a true story. Actually, people who acted in the film are some of the real life, the people who, the, the, actual, the actual people who participated in that event. And uh, you, you know that? Um, no, well, so what's funny is that um, I'm go going to very quickly, because I, I'm, I was trying to make my, I yes. was trying to be a little bit short, um, but here is what is funny. Um, look at this. Oh, yes. Yes. That's them. <laughs> yeah, that's, them. That, that's the three men. Yes. Um, no, and 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 I, in fact, so anyway, that's I'm I'm not I won't okay, I'm not okay. going to do a PowerPoint. Okay. So I was trying to do more, but okay. yeah, that it's a perfect example. And of those three men, two of those men uh, had been in the military, yes. so they had actually gone through this kind of training. And that's why, when you're in a heat of the moment thing, having training, having background, having experience, actually can prompt you to feel more comfortable acting. Yeah, great example. Yeah, yeah. great example. So uh, um, now we have uh, Kevin Brewer, who is a uh, nutrition major, who has a question for you. Hi, Kevin. Uh, hi, Anwar, and hello, Dr. Anderson. How are you? Sanderson, sorry. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you, too. Uh, I'd like to start off by saying on behalf of the class here and everyone watching uh, around the world that we thank you for taking your time to come, even though it's only virtually. I'm sure you would have <laughs> loved it up here right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> But my question for you is, in chapter eight of your book, you mentioned how 68% uh, of claimants who make cases on sexual harassment uh, receive retaliation from their supervisors or their superiors, and 64% of them lose their jobs within a year, uh, making a difficult situation even harder to withstand. So I was wondering, what steps do you think could we take uh, to make the workplace a more ethical area and to make sure that people who want to file these claims don't receive retaliation from their superiors. Yeah, that's such a great question. And, and that chapter was really hard to work on, frankly, because of course, people rightly fear, right? What, what are the consequences? And if I have to feed my family and you know, pay my rent or whatever, you know, how, can I, how can I take the risk? And we've actually, of course, all seen examples in many different walks of life of people being a whistleblower, people calling out bad behavior and experiencing really negative consequences. So what I think in terms of your very good question is I think we need to do a couple of things. I think one, we need to find ways of creating safe ways for people to report behavior. So that can be creating ways to report behavior anonymously. It can be having greater protections for whistleblowers, for people who call out bad behavior of various sorts. But the other thing I think is that's really important, and I'm actually doing a fair amount of speaking for uh, corporate clients now, um, because here's the thing. When you don't call out bad behavior at a low level, it continues. <laughs> <laughs> and it escalates. So it's actually really detrimental to organizations when you look the other way, because time and time again, what you see is that a, a small problem would just be a small problem. You could handle it, you could solve it, but people look the other way, look the other way, and then it escalates. And so I think part of the issue really becomes shifting the culture within organizations to understand calling out bad behavior is really a good thing for the organization. It's not threatening, it's not bad, because if you call it out, then it stops. And, and what we see in cases like Penn State with the Jerry Sandusky case, a lot of people knew. But if it had stopped when somebody first knew, Penn State would not be paying out millions of dollars to all of the victims. That's the exact same thing with uh, Larry Nasser in the Olympic gymnastics case uh, and uh, that doctor. And so one of the things that I think is really important is for companies to understand that bad behavior escalates. When it's not called out, it escalates. And trying to incentivize organizations and help organizations understand that this is really a good thing for organizations. It's not a bad thing. And I'll say one more thing, which I think is, is pretty timely, and that is that there's a real movement within this culture right now, within the United States, about what should we do about police departments? And, and there's been a lot of, you know, and again, not getting into the politics of defund the police or whatever, but I think the challenge is, is that when police departments overlook bad behavior by certain officers, that bad behavior continues. And it's often the case where ultimately that then becomes very, very costly to the police department and in some cases the city. And so trying to understand that 
calling out bad behavior on behalf of a colleague isn't whistleblowing or a bad thing. It's, it's helping the organization. It's supporting the organization and it's actually being a good colleague. And that's, again, I know that's a shift that we have to do mentally. Um, but if we could do that, you would actually not see the rates of people experiencing retaliation for reporting things as, as you um, so well noted in your great question. Thank you awesome. so much. Thank you, very much. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you. So as you know, um, uh, Catherine, you know, you, if, if you recall, James, James Herbert is a, is a yeah. president of a university. He's a psychology professor as though he's watching you live as, as, as we now say hello. But he has a, he has a, I'm, I'm sure he's restraining himself. He must have a lot of questions. But one of the questions he has is, how do you reconcile the importance of speaking up with the excesses of call out culture? How does one establish the line between the two? Yeah, that's, that's a fascinating question. It's actually one that I never got until around like June. <laughs> and then all of a sudden in June, that and like questions about politics become so important. <laughs> um, th those are the two that, that you know, just a, a giant shift. So, so what I think is so important in that case of the call out culture is that the call out culture can actually be a situation in which people are trying to do the right thing but, but they are actually doing it almost out of like a peer pressure sort of mob mentality. And so what, what I think is important to recognize is that we can call out what we feel is bad behavior without also saying, I am the arbiter of what is good and what is bad. And I think the challenge is that in many cases, people stay silent because they're concerned about the consequences. If you are concerned about the consequences that are leading you to stay silent, um, it's pretty understandable that you don't speak up. But the challenge with the call out culture is it's actually made people, I think in some cases, less able to call out bad behavior because they worry, oh my gosh, if I say or do the right thing or the wrong thing, will it be you know, the cancel culture? Will it be all of a sudden this escalating thing? And that's also where I think social media is really challenging. Because in some cases, technology, cell phones can be really helpful. Yeah. If somebody doesn't videotape George Floyd's death, we probably don't know what happened, right? That the, the reality of that scene is, is never um, known. But it can also lead people to feel less likely to step up because they worry about feeling stupid or they worry about being canceled um, or so on for saying or doing the right thing. And so I think that's a really challenging issue and one that, that we need to be looking more into in terms of research. Okay, so Jacob Odette, a uh, medical biology major, has a question for you. Thank you, Professor Sanderson. Uh, actually, talking about uh, social media, it's a good segue into the question I have with, in chapter one, you state the frequency and severity of aggressive and offensive behavior is greater if people are wearing masks, hood, or operating in the dark, uh, <laughs> even if they aren't necessarily in a group. Uh, do you think these characteristics necessarily parallel social media platforms? And if so, if we can't technically unmask the internet, uh, what are some remedies that you believe could solve cyberbullying problems that influence the heightened suicide risk for teenagers, as you stated in chapter six? Well, first of all, thank you for that very thorough read. I'm very impressed with your students. Um, that's boy, that's that's a wonderful example. Uh, so, so the anonymity is almost never a good thing, right? <laughs> we can see that sort of time and time again in which people are doing bad behavior and they're doing it be and they're wearing, you know, hoods, they're wearing masks, they're uh, you know, attacking people through false names. I, I think you see this on Twitter. I think you see it in all sorts of social media examples. And I really think that it's important for people to be able to own their words, to be, uh, to be able to own what they are saying in that sense. Um, I, I am on Twitter but I have a rule that I don't interact with anyone who isn't on Twitter by their actual name, because I'm like, I don't have any idea, you know, who you are. And I'm owning everything that I say with my name and my, you know, my picture and my profile and so on. I think anonymity is really a dangerous thing. I also think that we have a responsibility as a culture. And I think the example of cyberbullying is a great one. The, the story that I start chapter six with is of a little girl, 12 years old, uh, who was cyberbullied and died by suicide. And that little girl's mom has actually reached out to me um, after the publication of this book and said how much she appreciated me sharing her daughter's story and hoping that my book will inspire other parents to make sure that their kids are not engaging in those acts. I think what you see in, in many cases, and I talk about this in detail in chapter one, as you just noted, is that in conditions of anonymity, people often are not their best selves. And bad acts escalate. 
So cyberbullying often doesn't start with something that's going to lead somebody to die by suicide. It often starts with little comments, little jabs, you know, ostracism, et cetera. And so I think we need to be mindful that bad acts often escalate over time. And it's easier to engage in those bad acts when you're anonymous. Thank you. Thank you so much. Another question from, I don't know, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm going to sum up the question from James. Um, they may, they, they may be, they may, there are many cases in which there are differences of opinion on what is ethical. Uh, so how, I mean, I suppose, I mean, he's saying, I suppose you would argue that one should always speak up and the dialogue would resolve that question. But is that your, is that how would you, ad you would address that situation or? Yeah, I, I think that's, that it's a really important question. And, and here's a, an answer that I often give to this. My book examines when we fail to speak up because we are we feel inhibited for some reason and it doesn't my book is actually not on what is morally right and morally wrong so so i want to be clear about that my book is not this is the right thing to do my book is really about the psychology that leads people to stay silent so in different situations that could be a different um circumstance so the example that i often give is you could be a pro-life person in a community that is very pro-choice and you stay silent because everybody around you is so vehemently pro-choice that you don't feel comfortable sharing. Or you could be the reverse. <laughs> you could be a pro-choice person in a pro-life environment and you stay silent because you're fearful about what everybody else is going to say. So my book is not, you should do this, You know, this is what you have to do and so on. My book is really about, I think in lots of cases, individually, lots of people are saying, that's a problem and yet nobody is speaking up. And so understanding that relative normality of being in a situation in which somebody does or says something problematic and people fail to speak up. Um, so it, it does not assume that there is a moral choice, there is a not moral choice. Although I will say that what you see in many environments in which bad behavior continues, let's say, you know, Harvey Weinstein, let's say, you know, um, racist or sexist um, sexual harassment, Many people will later on report, oh, yes, you know, I thought that was problematic. I just didn't speak up. And so I think in the cases of very strong acts of bad behavior that are sort of universally understood, well, you know, you shouldn't, you know, use racist language, you shouldn't engage in sexual harassment, there is sort of a right or a wrong. But even in those cases, what you see again and again, are there are lots of people who knew it was bad. Um, if you look at examples of fraternity sexual misconduct, and fraternities are sort of you know, well known for being places in which sexual misconduct can happen, even in those cases, it's a tiny number of people. It's a very small, it's not everybody in a fraternity or everybody on an athletic team is doing this. It's a very small number of people engaging in the behavior and a lot of other people staying silent. And that's the challenge, I think. So uh, thank you so much. Chase Coppa from uh, Medical Biology Major has a question for you, Chase. Hi, Dr. Sanderson. So my question is as follows. On page 63, you discussed how even highly religious people are equally as likely not to intervene in controversial situations. With religion being arguably the biggest moral anchor and inspiration to do good in the world and still not pushing people to intervene, what will it take for humans to take action? Oh, I love that question. And I'll <laughs> also say as kind of an aside, I have a, a friend, colleague, Marie Griffith, um, who I will recommend for a future talk for you. So I'm recommending this for the Center for Global Humanities. Okay. She um, is the, the head of the Danforth Center at the University of Missouri. Uh, I'm sorry, Washington University in St. Louis. Um, uh, and she is, she's brilliant, um, trained at Princeton and, and Harvard. And she actually writes a lot about morality and religion. And I had talked to her early on about this book and sort of said, I had this idea. She and I have kids that are about the same age. And so we were both sort of identifying with it as moms. And she actually said to me, what's so interesting is that in religious communities, what you see is this pressure to be silent. Um, and it was a fascinating observation. And she talked specifically about the Baptist religion, uh, which she sort of is an expert in. And she described how there is this sense of you stay silent to protect this sort of broader community. And in a sense, that's exactly what you saw with the Catholic priest, you know, situation and so on. And so the challenge, of course, as, as your wonderful question illustrates, we think of religion 
as being a force for good. We think of religious people as being good people, as being God-fearing people, as being, you know, um, prayerful and spiritual and so on. And, and there are times in which that can be helpful that you can say, we'll do unto others and, you know, look out for the other person. But there are also times in which religiosity really leads us to feel a, a connection to our uh, community that is not helpful. I, I think of religion in terms of what we see happening in police departments, in which we have, I think, misinterpreted what loyalty means, that we should not have loyalty to officers who are breaking the law. We should not have loyalty to colleagues who are engaging in dishonest behavior. We should not have loyalty to members of our religious group, community, even religious leadership, if they are engaging in destructive, detrimental um, behavior. And the reality is religious organizations, police departments, fraternities, sports teams, they're all made up of people. They're all made up of people. And people are people and they have human weaknesses and they have fear of embarrassment and lack of um, you know, fear of inhibition and so on. And so all of those factors lead people to stay silent um, when they shouldn't. And, and I don't think that, that religious groups, although we might like to think of them as different, the same psychology of group inaction uh, can, can lead people to fail to speak up in religious groups the same as in all other kinds of circumstances. Yeah, really important question. Uh, thank you thank so you. much. Thank you. By the way, I just, you know, as you mentioned the name of M Marie Griffith, uh, she, she gave a lecture here at the Center for Global Humanities. God and Sex in America. It was a fascinating lecture. So it's Isn't she great? Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I'm glad you've already had her. She's 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 a dear friend. Um, and and she her her thoughts about religion with respect to this book were were super useful. Oh, absolutely. So um, we're going to go right ahead and, and ask uh, Christian Niles, who was a med biology major, also a pre-PA, to ask his question. Christian? Good evening. Uh, in your book, you talk extensively about skewed social uh, norms, um, especially amongst college students. And today, social media seems to give people an outlet to further perpetuate skewed social norms and to make them more difficult to combat. Um, do you think social media companies like Facebook, Instagram, and Snapchat should be responsible for rectifying so, uh, skewed norms? And if so, uh, what do you think the most impactful method they could employ would be? So great question. And I'm actually teaching this semester, my class is on social psychology. And I will say, this has been a heck of a semester to teach a class in social psychology um, with everything that has happened. Um, and so this is actually a topic that I, that I think about a lot. So what I think is that we have a responsibility, not Facebook, you know, not Instagram, you know, not the corporations. I think we have a collective responsibility. And here is what it is, to be honest on social media. And I think the challenge on social media is that many people present their best selves. Everything is going great. And, and the challenge is that creates a false norm. It creates a false norm of how people are doing. And we see this in all kinds of situations. We see it, as you pointed out, with college students presenting, you know, their best, their, their Photoshopped, their best image, you know, the, uh, and so on, in which everything seems to be perfect. They post pictures in which they're with lots of friends, or they used to be with lots of friends, um, in which they're doing, you know, fun things or whatever. And, and they don't post pictures or talk about times in which they are feeling lonely, in which they are feeling sad, in which bad things happen. And we see that example of sort of this false presentation on social media all the time. Um, I was struck early in the uh, coronavirus pandemic in which people were posting very regularly on social media and it was things like, now I'm baking all my own bread and I have sourdough starter and I'm training for the Boston Marathon and whatever. And I was like, you know, doom scrolling, sitting in my bed, you know, like, <laughs> how, how is this going to be? And, and, and yet I was not posting about that. And so part of it is that I think we have a responsibility to change social media, to talk about social media in terms of our authentic selves, not our fake selves. And I'm going to say one more example. Um, and this sort of harkens back to something that I talked about in my prior book, The Positive Shift, but my mother died about 16 years ago. And for years, I avoided social media on Mother's Day because it was a brutal day in which everybody would post pictures of, I'm at brunch with my mom, best mom ever. And, you know, and it was brutal for me to say. And then I decided to do something different. On Mother's Day, I would post a picture of me and my mom and I would say, I am really missing my mom today. 
And I would be honest about how it was a crappy day for me and that I was sad. And then I would tag all of the different people who I knew who'd also lost their moms. And I would say, and I'm thinking about you and you and you and you. And the number of people who wrote, wrote back to me, and first of all, shared a story about my mom. Oh, I remember your mom did it, whatever. But then also the number of people who wrote back to me and said, thank you for recognizing what today is like for me. Thank you for remembering. And, and, I, and I give that example because we can all show our authentic selves. We can all show our authentic self, our, our times in which we're struggling times in which we're not feeling great, times in which we're not even looking great. <laughs> and that's okay. Um, and I think that's also a really important part of changing the social norms so that our social norms aren't these false norms of all the other students have the answer and that's why they're not raising their hands. Our, our social norms instead would be accurate reflections of how we actually feel. Um, and in fact, research, some of the research that I've done with my own students has shown that correcting social norms, to be honest, can lead to lots of benefits. Redu reduced binge drinking, lower rates of disordered eating, reduced stigma about seeking mental health services. So um, I think we have a collective responsibility to be our actual selves, not our pretend selves on social media. And that will help. Thank you. <laughs> Catherine, what is the difference between ethical and moral? I mean, I'm just curious. So, so again, not a philosopher, um, <laughs> not a, not a, not a, whatever. But, but, I, but I think that one of the real challenges is that what is ethical and what is moral is very, very dependent on your culture, right? Yeah. It's what is what is ethical leadership? What is ethical leadership? And when we think about ethical leadership, it's often things like you are full of integrity and you are honest and you and you treat people with respect. But we can also think about morals. And people make different judgments about what is and is not moral behavior all the time. One of the most fascinating discussions that I'm hearing play out right now, literally right now um, in the United States is what should the Republican Party do when you have a president who basically seems to be not acknowledging you know, the results of an election that, you know, a democracy kind of depends on somebody stepping down. And, and there, that's a, a fascinating question about what is moral leadership? What is ethical leadership? Because different people are answering that question in different ways. And some people are saying, well, we're just going to kind of look the other way. And other people are saying, really, you need to step down. Um, but I think it's very hard to say, because I think our, our morals are heavily influenced by the situation we're in. Um, I'm, I'm giving this talk from my office in Amherst College, a, a school that 40 years ago, didn't admit women. <laughs> and that was seen as the right choice. It's no longer seen as the right choice. Great, right. thank you so much. Gabrielle Secchio, she's a, a medical biology major and also a pre-PA. Hey, Gabrielle. Hi, thank you for your words tonight. Um, my question is, how would you encourage fostering empathy with the current political climate and the polarized perspectives of the rep uh, Republican and Democratic <laughs> Yes. So I will say, again, the, the question I get most often these days really is about politics. Uh, so I think that we can go a long way towards trying to, trying to take somebody else's perspective, trying to imagine a situation um, in which we felt differently, in which you know, our views were um, those held by other people. I think finding common ground whenever possible is, is really useful and is really valuable. I also think that one of the challenges that we are facing right now is that there is a real lack of empathy very broadly. There is a survey that is given to college seniors and has been for years in which they, they rate levels of empathy. And what they have found and what is, you know, kind of a depressing reality is that every year they do the survey, empathy is lower. <laughs> so if you look back to 1975, you know, and so on, it's lower and lower. And of course, in some senses, that's not surprising because we have, you know, the rise of narcissism that we have this, you know, the selfie generation and so on. And so I worry a lot as a college professor, as a mom, as a person uh, in the world about ethical leadership. And I worry about empathy. I worry about our ability to put ourselves in somebody else's shoes. And I think what we're seeing in many, many cases is a lack of ability for people to do that. Now, I will also say the if people describe and however you voted you know whatever that election is is apparently done um but but one of the things that president elect biden was widely known for empathy 
That is what, you know, that many people said he is very, very good at feeling someone's pain that, you know, <laughs> feeling his empathy. And part of that is that he's kind of gone through some real tragedy that, you know, the death of a son, the death of a daughter, the death of a wife. And that is a lot of tragedy. And in a sense, I think that empathy comes in many cases from being able to put yourselves in somebody else's shoes by your lived experience. What is your lived experience? In, in what may be a fit of optimism, I'm hopeful that when college students return to normal class, so class without masks, class without social distancing, classes in which we're all together and not you know, by Zoom, I'm hoping that we return to a world that is higher in empathy. And here's my theory. My theory is that we, and I mean, we, you know, students at, the, at your school, students at my school, but also we Americans and we people in the world have all been through a, a shared, very, very difficult experience. The coronavirus pandemic has affected every continent. It's affected every person. Um, and, and as time goes on, more and more people are going to, to feel that even more acutely. I literally received an email yesterday that one of my students um, has coronavirus. Uh, two students at my school tested positive today, as did another faculty member. And this is the reality that more of us are going to have this shared experience. So what is my hope? My hope is that when we all return post-vaccine, post-pandemic, that maybe we've gotten a little bit better at being able to identify and empathize with other people um, because we've all been through something that is really, really difficult. And that is my hope. Wow, thank you, thank you, Gab thank you, Gabrielle. So I, I have a, um, I have first of all when I when I started reading your book, I, I could not stop thinking of one of my favorite novellas who, of all time, Gabriel Garcia Marquez's. I don't know whether you heard, uh, Chronicle of a Death Foretold. Uh, tell me, tell me. I mean, I, it's it's not mentioned there. I was dying to hear something about it in the book. Yeah, well, I want I, I I don't want to spoil it for anyone who hasn't read it. But tell me what that's such a fascinating connection. Tell me what tell me the link that you made with that. I love that though. Well, I mean, it's the entire town. Basically, everybody in the town knows that they're going after him. These two brothers are going to kill um, the the man, uh, and then uh, for, and they stopped him at one point. They stop him. They take the knives away, and so they come back. And even his fiance knows they're coming to get him. And and everybody else, the byst talk about bystander effect, right? I mean, everybody knows it's going to happen, and then it and then it happens. Yeah. Um, here's the other. So, so that's I love that connection. Here's the other one that I often get asked about, and I don't know. You probably know this one. Um, it's a short story, The Lottery. Yeah. No, I don't know. Um, so <laughs> Google that. I'm okay. not going to ruin that either. Okay. But it's but it's basically it's this horrific. I think it's um Shirley Jackson. I think. Um, but it's another example. And and here, but so here's what's so important. The reason that these stories novellas exist is because it's the human condition, right? Yes. Yes. It, it's the human condition. So so it doesn't. It, you don't have to have a PhD in psychology yeah. to understand <laughs> the psychology, right? Like, I, I mean. <laughs> You don't have to have a PhD in psychology to write about group inaction, right? Yes. And, and, and people be, uh, that's it, because yeah. it's a human condition. Yeah. And so, yeah, those, so there are examples. Again, there are historical examples. There are, there are examples in literature. There are examples in present day, because it is the human condition of people being silent in group settings. <laughs> And another, another. I mean, I just your 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 book prompted all these kinds of reflections. And another book and another story that came to mind is a stay is a is a case of Eichmann. Eichmann in Jerusalem. Uh, you know the story. He he was one who was responsible was responsible for the logistics of sending the Jews during the Holocaust. And, and in fact, I was thinking about that when I read that piece about the Holocaust and the people who who went against the system to protect to protect the Jews and. But here's a guy, here's a Jew who's a prominent, is one of the leaders of the Nazi regime responsible for the incarceration and extermination of the Jews in the camps. And then he's captured, put in trial in, in Israel. And he, has, he undergoes a lot of testing, psychological testing, and every one of them says he's normal. He's, in fact, more normal than the average person. And when he's asked why he did it, and that's why I asked you the question about the ethics and morality. He says, it was my job. 
Well, and and that's, I mean, the 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 sort of famous and you know, famous slash heartbreaking line, right? I was just following orders. Yes. Right. I mean, that's that's the heartbreaking line, right? That that I'm just following orders. So I was doing, you know, I was doing the thing, you know, just following orders. But the reality, of course, is that lots of people can say, I was just following orders. I was just following orders. That's what I'm doing. Um, and yet people can follow orders that are horrific orders. People can follow orders that are awful. People can follow orders that lead them to do terrible, terrible things. And and that's the tragedy, right? The tragedy is when people then even who might say, oh, this is really wrong. This is a bad thing to do. I'm not comfortable with this. And yet people are following orders. And, and that happens just time and time again. Um, here, I want to give you a, um, I, I thought of a quote that I really like that I think of, um, I'm trying to pull it up. Give me one second. Ask another question and I'm going to okay. pull it up. If you okay. have another question. Well, I mean, you know, in, in case, the, the Eichmann case uh, act, uh, actually confirms your case in the book when you say, People who are, have more self-esteem, people who are the moral rebels. When you talk about the moral rebels, the people who are who don't care too much about fitting in or uh, being liked and so on, they have that kind of independence from the from the group. And and so in the case of Eichmann, uh, what what's been revealed about him is that he was very much he he really very much needed to be in groups and be part of movements and so on and so forth. Although in the question of ethics, you know, as he he was working for his state, for his nation, and he was doing his job as prescribed. So in other words, he was not following orders of a gang. He was working in a company or a corporation, and he was, he, he was being the ethical worker uh, in that company. It, and it turns out that the ethics of that company were, were profoundly immoral. Well, 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 right. Well, and that's why ethical leadership flows from the top, right? Because yes. it, if there's somebody in charge who's saying, well, this is what you have to do and you're doing it, you, you, you can be doing it for a bad end, right? In that sense. Yes. Um, here, here's the quote, and it's, a, it's a, um, a Robert F. Kennedy quote. Moral courage is a rarer commodity than bravery in battle or great intelligence, yet it is the one essential vital quality for those who seek to change a world that yields most painfully to change. <laughs> so this idea of you know moral courage, it's rare. It's yes, rare. It's rare. Um, but 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 we can all get better at it. So again, yes. and and I say I say to people, uh, and I know you you and your students have done such a wonderful job of of so thoroughly reading my book, which is so flattering uh, to me as an author. But but my book lays out in you know sort of the first half is sort of the psychology of inaction. And then I turn to, okay, what do we under, what, what can we tell about the people who do stand up, who are like, uh, no, I, I'm not going to just follow orders. Like I'm out, like I'm, I'm not doing this. And, and what can we all do to develop our own moral courage if it's not something that comes to us naturally? And honestly, it doesn't come to most of us naturally, right? It doesn't. So there are things that we can do. So, I mean, is there a tension between ethics and morality, or they can be one and the same? Sometimes they could be different. Um, I remember a case of a, of a colleague of mine, he's a, he's a major philosophy professor, he started an article writing, said the police show up to his apartment, at, you know, asking if his roommate is a drug dealer. And he knew that his roommate was... So in the flash of a second, and this isn't published in a major journal, he had to make a decision uh, on what, which is related to his integrity as a person. And then he, he, he denied knowing anything. I mean, it's published in a major journal. And so because at, there are moments in life when you have to make this very quick fraction of a second decisions about what, what matters to you most, what, is, what would happen to you if you go, go this way or the other way, I don't know. Yeah, so so generally, when we think about morals, it's often things that are within ourselves. So, you know, sort of like attitudes or values or beliefs. And we think about ethics as being about rules. So what are the ethical guidelines? You know, what are the rules in that sense? But of course, um, we want them to be linked, right? We want our rules, we want our rules to follow from what we think are the guiding principles that, that are moral, that are, that are our right judgments. Um, but as, as you note, if you are in an organization in which 
you know, loyalty, for example, loyalty often becomes defined, and, and this, this harkens back to one of the, the questions from your excellent students, but loyalty often becomes prized in an organization, um, in a group, and, and it becomes valued above what are you being loyal to. So if somebody does something bad in your group, is your loyalty to that person or is your loyalty to something else? And, and to me, that's also one of the questions, right? So if you are obeying orders, who are you following? And the example I gave of the, the book about a uh, minister in France who refused to turn over the Nazis, he was ordered to turn over Jewish people in his town by what was then the leading government. And he said, that's not who I'm obeying. I'm obeying God. So he was separating it as, you know, God was the person he was obeying. Now we can also, of course, time and time again, see examples of people who've done horrific things in the face of obeying God. So that in and of itself is, is not um, necessarily a guiding principle, but it's an example of when we think about loyalty, what is your loyalty to? If a student knows that another student is engaging in misconduct, so is engaging in plagiarism, is engaging in you know sexual misconduct and so on, is his loyalty to that student who's part of his group or his friend or whatever, or is his loyalty to the, the class of students or his school or his professor or his coach or other things? And to me, that's one of the most important questions is for people to be able to make that separation within themselves to understand that they have agency and they have choice. Okay, and since I have you here, I'm dying to share with you a story and ask you a question. And many, many, many years ago, when I first came to UNE, I used to teach for years, I taught a film class. And one of the movies I used to like to teach is The Godfather. And many of my colleagues used to say, I can't, a very good friend of mine and colleague now passed away, he used to say, I can't believe you're teaching such a violent movie, it's a horrible movie, and da, da, da. So, and I, one day I decided to do a test. So when I showed the movie in class and I asked a student, I said, how many of you here would like to have the Godfather for your father? Everybody raised their hand. Everybody raised their hand? Yes. Wow. Okay, I, I'm gonna let I'm gonna let you comment on it because I'm sure I you saw the movie. Is there a question there? Is there is there a question? <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. and what was appealing? The power? The, I mean, what what was I appealing? No idea. It's like the, the the commitment to family, maybe the the loyalty, the the things that uh, there's a very fascinating. It, it, it was fascinating to watch. It, so the here's my colleague telling me that. Uh, it's it's a bad movie. To, it's a bad. It's, it's not a bad movie. It's a classic. It's a very good movie. And yeah. but the students, this you know, have a different perspective about the film and the Godfather himself. Um. So so what's interesting about that is that there is a human need, a, a human need, a basic human need to be a part of a group. Right, to do that, that we are social beings, we are mm -hmm. social animals, that we that it is evolutionarily adaptive to have your group, to have your town, your community, your culture, you know, your tribe, whatever. And so, in a sense, it's very normal for us to look to other people for rules and guidelines and for, for people to support each other. That that we follow lots of rules, that we stop at stop signs, you know, and so on, that, that we follow social norms and social rules. The challenge becomes when we stop being able to think for ourselves. Um, and, and that's really the challenge. So it doesn't, in a sense, it doesn't surprise me that The Godfather is very appealing to students because it's an, it's an illustration of, yeah, commitment, family, loyalty, power. Uh, and and in, in a sense, it's a very human need to fit in. And in some cases that, that can lead us to fit in for good. So I've used examples um, and we've talked about sort of a lot of examples of groups leading people to do bad behavior. But let me be clear, groups influence all kinds of behavior. So you can have situations in which people are pushing group members to do good behavior, to do the right thing in a sense. And I'll give you, um, I'm going to give you two examples, one personal, one research. So the, the research example is a very clever study done a couple of years ago uh, by researchers at Arizona State University. And what they did was compared rates by which hotel guests would reuse their towels, which of course is a really um, good and efficient, you know, thing to, to have happen. So one group got a little placard that said, you know, reusing your towel saves this much, you know, electricity and water, and it really helped mother earth. Another group of people got a little placard in the bathroom that said 85% of hotel guests 
reuse their towels because they care about Mother Earth and saving, you know, electricity and water. Okay, so Mother Earth or most hotel groups, guests care about Mother Earth. And then they looked at the percentage of people that actually reuse their towels. And what they found was that people didn't care about Mother Earth at all. But what they cared about was, oh, other people care about Mother Earth? I should care about Mother Earth. And that was effective. So that's an example in which yeah. people are like, I don't care about Mother Earth. But if you think other people care about Mother Earth, that changes you. Um, and, and, I'll, and I'll say on a, on a more personal note, and I describe this example in the book, a, a number of years ago, sort of early in my career at Amherst, I had a group of football players in my class who came every week but never talked. And it was really kind of a bummer. And so after about two or three weeks, I emailed the head football coach and I just said, hey, Coach Mills, I got like five of your guys and like none of them are talking and it's really kind of setting a bad, you know, tenor in the class. Can you help? And he wrote back in about a minute and said, yeah, tell me who they are. And I told him the names. And about a minute after that, he emailed those five guys, CC'd me and said, anyone who doesn't participate in Professor Sanderson's class doesn't play on Saturday. <laughs> That problem got taken care of very, very quickly. <laughs> and that's an example in which I had, I, I was not the leader, mm -hmm. right? I was not the leader. He was the leader. Mm -hmm. And what I needed him to do was to set a new norm. And the norm was talking to Professor Sanderson's class. Those guys came every time. They talked up a storm. It completely changed the dynamic of the class. Um, but I had to find the right leader. And so, so one of the things is that, that groups and leaders can also be used to create good. The, the key is it's that it's the social pressure, it's the social factors, and those can lead people astray or they can lead people actually to do very good behavior. So what I wanna do is try to harness the power of social norms and peer pressure and leadership for good. Yes. No, I mean, it's, it's by the way, are you, do you know Nick, Nassim Talib, you know, the skin in the game? You know, he's, yes. yeah, yeah, he's a fascinating Lebanese guy. He's very interesting. I mean, the question is, you know, one is conflicted here, what I see when I read a book like yours, is like, you are, you know, following the norms. If you don't, you know, being ethical in the workplace and other places is to make sure that people follow the rules and do the right thing. And if they don't, for somebody to speak up. And, and, and so, uh, and then there's the, the moral dimension of things. And, and, but sometimes to be a moral rebel is not, to follow the norms is to is is to break the norms, so to speak, uh, in order to make a difference. Yeah, that well, that's exactly right, and, yes. and so part of and and that's what um that's what moral rebels do, right? Yes. Moral rebels are like, yeah, I don't care if I look stupid, right? Yes. I don't care if right. Moral rebels are the ones who actually do. Yeah, that's a great point. Yes, exactly. Well, I think I mean, we're not going to exhaust this conversation. It's going to go forever and ever with you. And I'm sure we'll bring you back for dinner and James will join us and everybody, you know, will have a great time. And, and, uh, and hopefully after this uh, coronavirus thing goes away, we'll definitely want to bring you in person. Uh, well, um, it, it is always such a treat um, to, to speak um, with you all. Um, your students are so committed. Your yeah, community yeah. Is, yeah. Is, is doing such great work. And I, and I truly, I, I'm so honored with the invitation, but I'm so sad that, it, that yes. it's been Zoom. So, yes. <laughs> well, I hope, well, we'll be in touch. And thank you so much. I think this is a great, once again, this is an incredibly fantastic event.